Honor, Professor Dr. Esther Nyanya Malar Sarojini Daniel, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, is in ke, uh, ke majlis, yeah? uh, jadi syarahan perdana. Dan ini syarah, syarahan ini um, uh, uh, dah lama kita tak jalankan. Yeah? So this is something that we should be, uh, sesuatu, sesuatu, apa, event yang perlu kita um, uh, ni lah uh, ingatkan ya. So izinkan saya berbahasa Inggeris memandangkan syarahan Prof Esther adalah dalam bahasa Inggeris ya. Ladies and gentlemen, for information, I have known Prof Esther since I first came to the faculty in January 1997. I vividly remember how every Wednesday morning where she would organize a makan-makan under the club kebajikan faculty and the menu ranging from thosai to nasi lemak, okay? <laughs> and we used to work uh, together in many projects. And uh, if you see her CV, I always menempek my nama with her, okay? With a, a number of publications, if you, uh, if you look through her CV. So um, based on her CV, before coming to UM, she was a science teacher, as be mentioned by the MC, that you know, uh, she used to work in various schools, and one of the school is the college um, uh, the MCKK. Yeah, so the Makoba are here. Yeah, quite a number of you. So welcome. Okay. So she was a teacher for sixteen years, not only in Makoba, uh, in MCKK, but in Seremban, Kuala Kangsa, and Ipoh. And basically, most of her schools are residential schools. Here she has been. Uh, he, she has been uh, a science teacher, science educator for twenty three years. She did her BSc at here in in UM, and she has come a, a full circle to help to train teachers. So she's she has been you know tra training teachers since then. Her area of expertise and background is in science education, environmental education, technology integration in the classroom and learning as well as in cognition. She has supervised many masters and PhD students, I, and, and I believe many of them are here with us today. So welcome back. She has also conducted numerous training workshops and seminars related to research pedagogies and has been a master trainer for new lecturers in institutions of higher learning. Her research is focused on science education, in particular, environmental education. So she has worked with WWF Malaysia in conducting in-depth research and in training teachers in infusing environmental education. She has published numerous papers in journals as well as presented in various conferences, both local and international. She has written numerous training modules for, for te teaching and learning of the, of the science and environmental education. And most recently, she has also involved in medical education with a focus on the psychology of learning. Her latest book is entitled Biology Education in a Changing Planet. In 2016, Professor Esther received the UNESCO Hamdan International Award for the effective training of teachers in Paris from the Director General of UNESCO on October 5, 2016, which is the day designated as World Teachers Day. More recently, she received the Venus International Women's Award for the Life Achieve, lifetime Achievement in Science Education, Specialization in Biology. <laughs> with that, I present to you Professor Dr. Esther Daniel with her inaugural speech entitled A, A Science Educator's Journey of Map Chasing Rainbows. Let me begin by talking about a poet. Keats, the great poet, 
lightheartedly accused the scientist Isaac Newton of destroying the poetry of the rainbow by explaining the origin of its colors, thus dispelling the mystery of the rainbow. Richard Dawkins, a contemporary scientist, however, disagrees and argues that Keats could not have been more mistaken and shows how an understanding of science inspires the human imagination and enhances our wonder of the world. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming for this event entitled A Science Educator's Journey Off the Map, Chasing Rainbows. I hope it will be a colorful presentation for all of you. Let me begin. Rainbows have been an inspiration to poets. If we are on higher ground or on a plane, we can actually see a circular rainbow. Scientists can tell whether there are chemical pollutants in the air just by analyzing the uh, radius of a rainbow. Then, for science educators like me, rainbows are meaningful because the important 41 degrees for reflection is located relative to the viewer and moves with the viewer. This means that none of us will ever reach the end of the rainbow, although we might have fun trying to. Why is this meaningful? Because it is a journey that never ends, a journey of the map. Because teaching science should be new every morning, as the saying goes, and we must be in awe and wonder of science, and it should never end. Hence, my choice of title. Okay. Before I go further, I need to give some definitions. A science educator. For me, I had to wear several hats along the journey. First, I was a secondary school teacher. Then, as a science teacher educator, as well as, as, well as a supervisor, of research in science education. So I had several hats to wear. So I will talk this afternoon about this journey that I had to take. Okay, first, science teaching and learning. Where are we now? Okay, so if we look at our science classrooms, I'm sure many of you will agree we have fantastic books. We have a wonderful curriculum. It is true. Very well planned. Okay? And all these curricula expound the wealth of science, scientific discoveries that have been made for hundreds of years. Okay? And all these books plus workbooks help teachers to, in a way, transfer the knowledge from the books to the minds of the students, okay? So you may ask, is not this science? Isn't science a body of knowledge that needs to be transferred from the teacher to the student? Okay, and of course, they will need observation and experimentation as well. But let me take you through some points. We know what is academic achievement, right? Students get A, so definitely the transfer of knowledge is effective. However, wait, do you know that the ratio of 60-40 started almost 41 years ago, but we as yet have not been able to get that number of ratio in our student population, okay? Why is there a decline in our enrollment then? If all the 
resources in science education is effective. All right? Could it be students perceive science as very difficult? Could it be that science is boring? Or is it because there's such uh, less you know, emphasis on hands-on science from at this point of time? All these points are not from me. These are given by our Ministry of Education. They also have stated that when uh, science practicals were reduced drastically, okay, uh, especially when the science practical exams were cancelled in the two early 2000. And just last year, the Deputy Minister of Education stated that the decline of numbers of students in science could be because of a packed and difficult curriculum and unattractive teaching and learning activities. All right? Now, what actually are these unattractive teaching and learning classroom? What is happening? Okay? So if we look at it, classrooms are didactic. What is emphasized are facts. All right? And facts. And facts. Okay? And then there is, of course, reduced experiential learning in the classrooms. We have cookbook or recipe experiments being conducted, which is good in a way. Uh, it does transfer knowledge, but maybe does not encourage the self-directed uh, learning that is required. And of course, we all know there's a lot of memorization. Let me tell you a short story which my friend related to me just last week. In a very, very well-known school in KL, primary school, science. What happened was the daughter of my friend wrote the answer observing as one of the science process skills, which the teacher marked incorrect because the word should be observation. Sorry, she wrote observation, but the teacher said it was observing. Sorry for the mistake. So can you imagine that the, the child went home and started memorizing? It should be observing, observing. In all my tests, I must answer observing. I cannot write observation. I leave you to think about what that means against what I have just said. Okay? Now, all this could lead to what we call in science education research as cognitive overload. And our children, maybe as they move up along the educational ladder, might just experience this and be put off science. All right? Now, how was my journey? Okay. To transfer the knowledge into the minds of learners is not an easy task. And in order to complete the syllabus, as we have uh, looked at earlier, unattractive teaching and learning activities surface. What teachers normally do, we bombard the students with definitions to be memorized and endless terminologies that they need to reproduce in the exams. Okay? And also, sometimes the presentation of such enormous information can be very lackluster, uninteresting, and the explanations given for these complex um, concepts may not be adequate and unclear. All right? So, my journey. Now, the leap from planning and executing transfer of a difficult curriculum to the mind must also be aimed at the heart and spirit of a learner. Okay, and this is a journey unto, into the unknown. So what did I do? I chased rainbows. Okay? It is a journey off the map that I decided to take. The journey begins first with building a rich and wonderful bond between teacher and student. I think some of you might recognize yourselves there. Okay. And I used to have um, 
classes most of the time outside the classrooms, okay? And um, it helped me, first of all, build a very good bond with my students. Next, ah, that was a stargazing night, okay? So you build a relationship. And what I did was, I did not use much of the textbooks and the workbooks. They were actually laid aside. And I preferred to use these books only as references. All right? And the curriculum was disassembled. I rearranged it, recreated, and reassembled to portray the simplicity of science to my students. Learners had to articulate the experiments and activities carried out, and it was music to my ears whenever I heard this. These are all some of the outdoor activities under a tree, near the river, and I like to hear my students tell me, Chegu, what are we doing today when they come into class? Okay, so they expect the unexpected, not um, say, for example, activity 3.2 of the textbook, all right? Now, the scientific enterprise is full of imagination, and our science classrooms must be as well. Whether viewing pollen grains under the microscope or a model of the skeleton, sorry, okay, uh, the wonder of how nature is so simple and exact and symmetrical must be communicated. Okay, when we see a rainbow, what do we actually see? This is where I'm going to take you into the analogy of a rainbow and how it related to my journey. Okay, so if you see a rainbow, you can see two mediums, all right? There'll be air and there'll be glass or there'll be water, depending on what you're looking at. In this case, it's a prism, so it's a reflection of the rainbow. And you will see that light is refracted. It's not a science lesson here, yeah? just bear with me. And, uh, this, the, and then the light is reflected. Okay, very simple analogy. However, when you're looking at a teaching learning situation, the two medium teacher with all our thinking processes, and we have the learner with all their thinking processes, and we are trying to transfer our knowledge into their heads. And it's not an easy process, okay? So information transfer, what happens is you can use experimentation, field trips, as you've seen from the photographs, projects, discovery, whatever you can use. And of course, the teacher must keep in mind all the different kinds of learning preferences. And what happens is, when you teach one single concept to a group of students, not everyone will understand it the same way. If you refer to the uh, booklet that is given to you, I have cited some of the research done in that area, which I'm not going to go into now. Okay? So if, for example, you have prior knowledge within the student's mind, and then new concepts are being taught to them. Okay, one student, which is, uh, who is represented by the red arrows, may connect all the concepts in this manner. But another student, indicated by the green arrows or yellow arrows, will, may connect the concepts in different ways. So, no two students will ever form the same understanding that you are trying to convey to the student. And the teacher must realize that. That's the first thing that you realize when you think of the rainbow. You see, a rainbow, it depends on the position where you stand. Eh? Where you stand, you only see a tiny fraction of the raindrops that are involved in producing the entire rainbow. Someone a few meters away will see a different rainbow because of other raindrops in their position. 
Even more amazing is, these raindrops are not standing still in the atmosphere. They're falling, continuously falling. So each raindrop passes through my rainbow for only a moment. And then other raindrops take its place. So it's a continuous action, yeah? So amazingly, no two persons will see the same rainbow at any time. So that is what happens in teaching and learning science as well. And the teacher must understand this, okay? So that was the dawn of my journey after four years of training at the university to become a science teacher. When you enter the class, that is what you realize. Students understand things in different ways. You can't even begin to imagine the different ideas that they can come up with, okay? But imagine we must because as, uh, te as teachers, we need to conceptualize that, okay? All right, now, um, All nervous this system is functions just a simple video to show you how our brain cells actually cells. connect to each other during neurons learning. Neurons conduct messages okay? as electrical signals. It's very short chemicals video. To spread so them you can along. see all the electrical circuits moving in the brain of your students when you teach them. Okay? But the other thing that we need to do after this is that once they have constructed these conceptual structures, which are also different, the teacher needs to actually help the students to reflect, to recall what they have learned, and help them to develop a deeper meaning as they go along with various activities. All right? So this is the part where the seven colors of the rainbow, to me, reflects what is learned by the students, the visible part where teachers can help to help them to understand better. Now, in preparation for this lecture, I did ask some of my former students to say a few words. So first uh, is Prof. Z Dr. Zul, he's sitting right here. This is for the audience. I have known AD for quite a long time. She was my biology teacher. She's a teacher with a difference and uh, she's brought a whole whole new way of, of learning biology that kept us captivated. It was very interesting and uh, I've learned a lot from her teaching and it's partly responsible for where I am at the moment. Uh, even recently we had a chat with among my batchmates, everybody agrees that you're such a wonderful teacher um, and we owe a lot to you. So, all the best and uh, you're an angel. Stay sweet. Good luck for your inaugural. Okay, thank you. The next person is Kamaro Aslan. He was my first student in 1980, all right, when I was in Siddhar Sremban. This is what he has to say. Hi, I'm Aslan. Chego Esther was my bio, my bio teacher when I was in high school. I hated the sciences, but I love bio because of her. Many of her students got distinctions for bio. I did not. But I learned a lot more from her about life, about being a good human being, things that I really value. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Terima kasih, Cikgu. I love you very much. So, it's not just about content. It's also about what you transfer to them about other things related to life that comes as a package. Thank you. All right. Now, so we have covered, so to speak, the visible spectrum of knowledge, which we think is the accumulated body of knowledge where we need to transfer it to the student. However, simultaneously, we need to remember that the invisible spectrum needs to be also transferred to the student. What do I mean by the invisible spectrum? You see, delivering facts is already a daunting task for the teacher, but a science educator cannot stop there. There is more. Okay, let me take you through what I mean, huh? Um, for me, 
when I wanted to share the invisible spectrum of the knowledge of, of, the, of the rainbow with my students, what I felt was it was a dialogue with nature. Science is nature, all right? So, for example, you look at a butterfly, a blue butterfly, and it has what we call not pigment coloration, you know, but it's structural because it has wings, scales, and so on. So you can actually um, teach students about physics of light. You can teach them biology. You can teach them environmental science. So it is not just facts that you're teaching. And then you can talk about um, the bat. We learn bat in biology, but it also talks about echolocation, sound waves, so you can talk about physics of sound besides biology and environmental science. So when you teach, it needs to be connected to many things that will make the student interested and also expand their minds about things around them. And also nature teaches us many other things. For example, sunflowers. They are involved in phytoremediation where they hyper-accumulate any kind of toxins. And it has been shown to be successful, all right? Like in places like Chernobyl and so on. And it is also touching on chemistry, biology, and environmental science. So there's a lot more than what we teach in schools nowadays, which are all compartmentalized nicely into topics and subtopics. There's so much more that we can do. And nature is the teacher, actually. It's a model, it's a measure. Nature can even be our mentor. But I don't have time to go into it right now. We have things like biomimicry, but I think many people would understand. So nature is a source of rich inspiration to teach science. Science explains the natural world. All right. So for example, it classifies things, make it simple. That's how we understand nature. So classification is done in all fields of science. But the classification indicates something more, which is how intelligible science is, how simple science is, and how orderly science is. So I cannot understand when students find science difficult because it's actually something that makes the world simple, simple to understand. So maybe it is in our delivery that we need to check. Okay? Also, there's elegance and beauty in science. So if you look at classifications, oh, sorry, how to understand nature, physical sciences, biology, I think there's a small mistake here, never mind. All right? But it's the beauty and the elegance. What do I mean by elegance? Elegance in science was actually defined as something that is eternal because when natural laws are uncovered, they rarely get changed unless there's a drastic new discovery. So whatever no laws of nature, be it physical, chemical or biological, there's this simplicity, there's this elegance and beauty in them, which unfortunately, may not be delivered as they should be because science is thought to be difficult by the students somehow when it is actually simple. Okay? All right, now, like Albert Einstein. By the way, today, is, I think it's Albert Einstein's birthday, if I'm not mistaken, all right? So a look deeper into nature and then you will understand everything better. So we often forget that we are nature. All right? So science is nature and nature is science. So don't just think that biology is the science of nature. Physics is too. Chemistry is also the science of nature. Okay? Ah, here we are. Now we have two more students who are going to testify to the journey that they took along with me. This is Bhaktia. Miss Esther was more than just a biology teacher to me. 
She taught me that through science, we can look at the world through a very wide spectrum. Miss Esther was more than just a biology teacher to me. She taught me that through science, we can look at the world through a very wide spectrum. The environment that we live in, the communities that we interact with. She has set me down a path of working towards better public health and towards environmental sustainability. Thank you, Miss Esther, for this gift of a lifelong journey towards making the world a better place. I think Beth is sitting at the back. Yeah, okay. And then uh, there's Dr. Mohasmi from UM, PPUM. Hi, Cikgu Esther. Uh, I like to feel proud and privileged to become one of your ex-students during my earlier education day. Uh, you was my biology teacher in Malay College for the Cancer. And since then, you are my idol. I've been looking, always looking up at you. I'm sure um, my other friends also feel the same way. And uh, not only you are a great teacher and excellent uh, and dedicated teacher, but you also have inspired me in many ways in becoming a family medicine specialist and also in becoming someone who really appreciate and care about nature and also becoming an academician like you today. I always feel that you're always there to guide me along the way. I don't know why I feel that way. It could be from the invisible spectrum from your teaching that have guided me into this mysterious direction and I thank you. Thank you. That is Dr. Mohasmi from PPUM. Now, after all my years of teaching, uh, 16 years of teaching in the secondary schools, I moved on to the University of Malaya where I trained science teachers. So I basically passed on to them this knowledge that I have learned about science. How we can communicate the wonder and beauty of science to um, our students, okay, and one of them is uh, Lim Xiao Fong, who is now teaching at SMK Manja Lara Kapong. She was my very first student here many, very, about 20 years ago. Hi, Dr. Esther was my lecturer about 20 years ago. As I can remember, her lessons were always fun and interesting. She is such a great teacher. She demonstrates teaching skills with various effective methods and engaging personality. She is my role model. Okay, so that's one. And there are many, many students who have come out and I hope they have learned a lot. And I learned alongside with them, yeah? Okay, so I know we talk a lot about critical skills and creative skills and so on. But sometimes I think we need to go a little bit deeper and look at certain skills that we may not mention so much, okay? But actually, sometimes what are critical and creative skills may also be blurred to many, all right? So, we can look at analogical skills, the one I'm trying to use here with the rainbow, using the rainbow as an analogy. Mechanistic reasoning is very important in science. Argumentative reasoning is also very important in science. Representational re uh, reasoning is also very important. And all these reasoning have been uh, researched into by my students and they've done an excellent job. And you can look at the uh, citations in the booklet. And inductive reasoning, you have deductive reasoning, and self-directed learning, and many, many more. All right. So in science, the way we teach will ensure that these skills are really embedded and infused and inculcated in them very strongly. Okay? And um, this is one of my PhD students, uh, her journey with me, very short. Now she's and in Singapore. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have made it through the PhD. So for me, Professor really is the rainbow. And for many of us who were her students, we're all blessed because she's so nice. And she gives you all the credit for your work when actually she's the strong person behind us. So I'm really grateful for my time with Never mind. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, there were other journeys. There are about five or six who are now working in the medical education unit in UM, who are actually uh, our students from the Faculty of Education. They have given a long, maybe you can just, they have a very long video, so we'll just show a little bit of each. Other journeys. Other journeys. Uh, thank you. Prof. Esther is a very special person This is Dr. Me. Sim Jim Ho. She was my lecturer, supervisor, ever caring, loving and inspiring. Prof. Esther. You have been a this is Dr. Hong Wei Han, also Faculty of Medicine, Medicine UM. And then as a PhD students at the end, so much from you, Esther. Then we have uh, Dr. Thank you, Prof. For being Dr. Kwan Siu Wai, who is now Thank helping you, Prof, us. Thank you, Prof. for being patient with me throughout my PhD journey. This is Dr. Anwar from UMK in Kelantan. Congratulations. This is a lot of time Dr. Li Shusheng is now in the National University of Singapore. We have a lot of discourse from the problem conceptualization yeah. phase until the data analysis. Uh, Dr. Fong, all right. You are my role model. Thank you. All right. So these are some of the students who have undertaken the journey into the invisible spectrum of the rainbow. They, I believe very strongly in their work, have uncovered much, much more um, knowledge and, um, and a lot, not just facts and, and uh, figures, but also that mind knowledge that touches the mind and the soul, which is so necessary for science education, okay? And um, my journey has taken me a long, long way, all right? And what I can conclude right now is that Einstein at 16 had a question. What would it be like to ride at the speed of light alongside a light beam? How can we make our students ask such questions like that? I believe it has to be more than just textbooks and workbooks. It has to be through efforts made by the teachers in, into more creative teaching. All right, You have to allow that liberty and freedom for your students to think, to express and to articulate themselves. And um, the visible light represents the small section of the spectrum, but the information carried by the waves of the invisible light is much more abundant. So I think that's where we need to direct our students simultaneously as we endeavour to teach the facts that are so necessary for them to pass their exams. Okay? So I would like to end with a quote by Buckminster Fuller, who said that, a teacher's influence upon learners... Huh? The National Science Foundation in U.S. asked the great breakthrough scientists what they felt to be the most dominantly favorable factor in their educational experience. The answer was almost uniformly intimate association with a great inspiring teacher. All right. So with that, I thank you and I thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, there's something somebody wants to say to you. Could you kindly click um, on the desktop, Z and A? Dewasa ini kita saling merayakan Kejayaan yang akhirnya membinasakan Apalah gunanya kematangan pikiran Bila di jiwa kita masih lagi muda Dan mentah kulihat hijau Professor, keep going green I'm with you Okay, I'd like to now invite the chair, Prof. Rohaida, to close the, the lecture. Please, welcome. Okay, I guess there's no need for me to summarize, it's very clear. But overall, what has been said is that her journey, how she has, uh, you know, uh, of her own journey, 
and she has taken us through being a, a teacher, then a lecturer, as well as a researcher. And each phase, she plays an, a different role, where you know uh, she gives a glimpse uh, as you know as a teacher, she gives us a glimpse about the issues in science education, issues in teaching and learning of science, and how he, he, it has impacted. Um, you know, um, students' learning, and also uh, she did mention about uh, how a good teaching and learning of science should go beyond the knowledge itself. Okay, and uh, as a lecturer, she how she has you know groomed and has uh, trained the postgraduate students to go beyond. And for your information, today is her last day. <laughs> okay, and but I hope that you will keep coming. Uh, do come, uh, uh, do come over and help us. We need all the help. I know that you know is with this uh, at the moment with this situation. You know, we are not able to open, uh, to continue some of our prominent professors in the service. So without. Anything else? I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Chair uh, Prof. Raida Mohamad Saad, um, Dean of the Faculty of Education. Before we go on to refreshments, we'd like to have a photography session. Could we kindly have probably everybody on stage, Professor? Okay, one, two. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Prof. Esther. Happy birthday to you. Okay, get ready for the photography. Smile, everyone.